Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Psalm 8. It is Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name throughout the earth. You made your glory higher than heaven. From the mouths of nursing babies, you have laid a strong foundation because of your foes in order to stop vengeful enemies. When I look up at your skies, at what your fingers made, the moon and the stars that you set firmly in place, what are human beings that you think about them? What are human beings that you pay attention to them? You've made them only slightly less than divine, crowning them with glory and grandeur. You've let them rule over your handiwork, putting everything under their feet, all sheep and all cattle, the wild animals too, the birds in the sky, the fish of the ocean, everything that travels the pathways of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name throughout the earth. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, I am um, not an overly emotional person, unless I'm driving on I-4 or the Gators are losing. Um, but I do, which happens a lot recently, but um, I do have a, a sentimental streak in me. Anyone else got a sentimental, anybody else here is a sentimental kind of person? Whenever Kara and I have moved, and that has now happened six times uh, since we've been together, um, I always make one last pass of the house. And I always tell her that it's because I want to make sure we didn't leave anything, but she knows that I'm kind of fibbing a little bit. That's not the main reason I'm doing it. It's because I want to spend a moment in each room of the house, thinking back through all of the things that happened in each of the rooms, both good and bad. And I give thanks to God for those memories and for the blessings that that structure, the time that it was our home. Even when we lived in Athens, Georgia, we were there for three years and lived in two houses. The second one, only one year, and I still did that. Now, kind of, you know, that was where we brought our first child home to, so that made that one year kind of special. But um, I do it wherever we go, wherever we live. Now, sometimes the sentimentality fuses with ritual. And so I do the same thing repeatedly. And that makes sense, because ritual is part of how you infuse meaning into an otherwise ordinary task. Right? I mean, when we light these candles every Sunday... They're meant to represent the Holy Spirit. They're not just a chemistry reaction or you trying to air out your house after you cook shrimp at home, right? These candles are special. This loaf, these loaves of white mountain bread, that's what I grill every time we grill. And yet here, today, they become for us the body and blood of Christ. A few weeks ago when we were on vacation, we were up in the mountains of North Georgia, and the first night we were there, Auden and I went out to this amazing overlook. We could just see for miles and miles and miles into the Blue Ridge Mountains. And as the light began to fade and Auden was rock hopping all around, I pulled out my phone and I played a version of the doxology by a singer-songwriter I'm a fan of. And it just felt right in that moment. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. I played it again the next morning on the porch. 64 degrees, cup of coffee. The coffee wasn't 64 degrees. The air was 64 degrees. I had a hot cup of coffee and a view of the mountains. I played it again the next night and each morning and night that we were there. It was like two and a half days, but it became my ritual. It served as an orientation. I know you know that word generally, but I would remind you that this is the first bit of a series Jeremy introduced to us last week, a cycle that we go through in life. Orientation, disorientation, reorientation, or from your perspective, orientation, <laughs> disorientation, reorientation. And what it reminded me was that those days weren't just a break. They weren't just a vacation. They weren't just a couple of days away from work and from home, but those days were a gift from God, and I shouldn't squander it. How many of you have ever been on a vacation and found yourself spending most of the time just worried about the logistics, or worried about the weather, or worried about keeping the kids entertained, and you find out you're more stressed there than you were at home? That's what orientation is supposed to do, right? It sets the tone, even the direction. It helps frame the experience in that time, in that place. Think about the orientations that you've been to before. College orientation, or starting a new job, or joining a new organization, 
Or the orientation you get from the HOA when you move into a new neighborhood. Here's what you can and can't do. How about the next steps class here at Lakeside, right? It helps you understand who you are in relation to where you are in relation to why you are there. It sets a base set of expectations. And for me, all of these streams sort of came together at the birth of both of our children. I wanted to do something intentional to welcome Auden and then Brooks into the world. Something that I know they would never remember, right? They're not going to be fully aware of what's going on. But it's something that I could tell them for the rest of their life. This is what I did to welcome you to the world. And for me, I decided to select a piece of music because music has just always meant something to me. I've played it, listened to it, all that kind of stuff. So what would be the first song I would play for my first child? I considered great pieces of classical music. I considered a hymn or a praise song. I even thought about my favorite songs, but what I settled on wasn't actually any of those. But again, it just seemed right. And I used it both for Auden and for Brooks. I chose What a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue and clouds of white, the bright blessed day, the dark sacred night, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow so pretty in the sky are also on the faces of people going by. I see friends shaking hands saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. I hear babies cry. I watch them grow. They'll learn much more than I'll ever know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Yes, I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Now, is this the coolest song ever? No, we can all agree on that. Is it the most musically interesting song you've ever heard in your life? Maybe outside of Louis Armstrong's God-given voice, the answer is no. It's really just a rearrangement of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, if you think about it. And the words are so very simple. They sound like a children's book. In fact, we have a children's book of this song. But there is just something about it when you listen to it. Louis Armstrong, this accomplished and gifted and respected musician, is taking this song way too seriously. Kind of like when Phil Collins did the soundtrack to Tarzan. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Animated movie about a guy raised by monkeys, and Phil Collins writes the greatest soundtrack of a movie of all time. But you can tell that Louis feels it, and he means it. It is almost defiantly optimistic. And the reason I think this comes through is because it really is the heart and the history behind the song. It was written by George David Weiss and Bob Teeley. Teeley was a producer who had worked with all sorts of jazz legends, and Weiss had had some success as a songwriter. He had co-written The Lion Sleeps Tonight. But it was now the late 1960s, and jazz was on its way out. Campy songs like The Lion Sleeps Tonight were on its way out. Rock and roll and the Beatles and all that was on the way in, if not already there. And surprisingly, Louis Armstrong had just had a minor comeback. Anyone ever heard of Hello, Dolly? There's the stage show. Well, the producers of the stage show paid him to write a song, sing a song, to promote the show opening in 1964. And that song, to the surprise of everyone, shot to the top of the charts, dethroning the Beatles. And at 63 years old, he became the oldest artist ever to have a number one song. It won Song of the Year, and Armstrong won Best Vocal Performance at the 1965 Grammys. He signed a new record deal with a new company, and he began to put together a new album, and this is when Weiss and Teeley saw their opportunity. See, they'd written this really simple song about how wonderful the world was, but you could easily, especially in that moment of time, call them incredibly naive. Because the changes in the 1960s weren't just in the style of music, were they? It was the civil rights movement. It was the Vietnam War and the protests around it. There was massive social change. There was unrest and violence. There was division. You know, then they said, we haven't been this divided since the Civil War. And now we say, we haven't been divided since then. No one would want to record this song. But then they heard about Louis. And Louis had this incredible 
ability to bridge divides and bring people together. And so they pitched him the song and he said, sure, let's do it. And so the two songwriters flew out to Las Vegas where Louis was playing a regular gig at the Tropicana Hotel. They decided to record it at the end of one of his shows when he was all warmed up. Uh, the tough part about it, the catch was that his last show of the day started at midnight. So it was 2 a.m. when Louis Armstrong, in his late 60s, shuffled in to a recording studio with an orchestra. And in those days, most recordings, especially jazz recordings, were done live. So you, you mic everybody, you hit record, and you go. And if anyone messes up or anyone sneezes or anything outside bleeds into the room, you're done. you got to start all over again. And uh, shortly into the session, they had a problem. The owner of Louis's new record company had also flown out. He wanted to take pictures of his new star. And as he heard them rehearsing the song, he got pretty upset because he thought he was getting another Hello, Dolly, an upbeat number. This was a slow, sappy ballad, and he hated it. He tried to put a stop to the recording session. They just pushed him out the door and locked it and kept going. For the rest of the morning, they battled freight trains just outside, and Larry, every once in a while, shouting or throwing something against the window. They finally wrapped at 6 a.m., what kept them going, though, was Louis, every time they had to stop, would just shake his head and laugh and say, let's do it again. By that time, all of them were owed overtime. And of course, Louis being the big name, they were going to pay him first, but he refused to take anything more than the base rate to ensure that the rest of the orchestra got what they had earned that night. The recording session had become the embodiment of the intentions for the song. That yes, there is craziness and chaos and anger and conflict in the world, but the wonderful world underneath it all is worth working for, no matter what it took and no matter how long it took. Now, unfortunately, ultimately, the president of the record company still holds the fate of a song in his hands. And they released it, but he didn't promote it, and it sold less than 1,000 copies in the United States. In the UK, it topped the charts. It did slowly gain steam here in the United States as it got featured in TV shows and movies. It was on The Muppet Show in 1977. Here's a great piece of trivia for your next uh, dinner party. How many of you remember the show Family Matters? Steve Urkel, yeah? What a Wonderful World was the theme song for the first five episodes of that series. But the most impactful use of the song, the one that got it climbing up the charts, was when it was used in the movie Good Morning Vietnam played in the background of images of war and violence and destruction. And to show you how wrong the record company president was, in 2021, Rolling Stone named it the 171st best song ever written. And in a way, part of what makes this song so impactful is that it has really never stood alone. It has always been up against a backdrop of chaos and conflict and violence and division, not just in the movies. I mean, can any of you think of a period of time from the 1960s to today when everything was wonderful and the world was at peace and everybody loved each other? Louis even spoke to this in 1970, just three years after recording it. He said this, some of you young folks have been saying to me, hey, pops, what do you mean, what a wonderful world? How about all them wars all over the place? You call them wonderful? And how about hunger and pollution? That ain't so wonderful either. Well, how about listening to old pops for a minute? Seems to me it ain't the world that's so bad, but what we're doing to it. And all I'm saying is see what a wonderful world it would be if we'd only give it a chance. Love, baby, love. It was 1970. That's the secret. Yeah. It's lot, if lots more of us loved each other, we'd solve lots more problems. And so I played this song for both of my children to welcome them to this world because I wanted them to know that it is a wonderful world. Of course, the challenge is the more that they grow, the more that they live, the more that they experience, the more that they observe, they are beginning, at least Auden, the older one, is beginning to see and feel bad stuff too. The first time my four-year-old came home and said, people were laughing at me rather than with me today. 
It is impossible to have the television on any time in the evening these days if you have kids around the house. But that's the cycle that we all live through. That's the framework of this whole series. There's the orientation, but then inevitably there's disorientation. But it doesn't stop there, right? There's reorientation. Jeremy shared with me last week what he envisioned when he thinks through this cycle. It's not just a little map, but he envisions a mountain range with peaks and valleys and mountain range going off into the distance. So valleys overlap with peaks and peaks with valleys. And isn't that how life is? There's some areas of your life where you're probably feeling like you're at the peak right now. And there's some areas of your life at the same time you feel like you're in the valley. And most areas of life were either on the way up or on the way down. It's what I saw that night at the Overlook. And from the deck of the cabin as I listened to the doxology, my guess is for the foreseeable future, whenever I hear the doxology, I'm going to be reminded of that moment. I'm going to be reminded of those moments, reminded of what God tried to remind me in that moment. So even though, you know, Next Sunday in the first service, Rob is going to be playing from here, which is not a mountain, but it is slightly elevated, and it's never 64 degrees in here. I'll still feel connected to that moment. It calls us back. That's the power of orientation, isn't it? It calls us back. It reminds us. Look, I I have a great life. I have so much to be grateful for. Very few complaints, at least not very valid ones. But like everyone... I also have times of disorientation, when things don't go right, when things are challenging, when things are even painful, and perhaps the the biggest challenge in moments of disorientation is to remind yourself that that's not where you started. How many of you have areas of pain in your life that you actually can't remember when it wasn't hurting? And as someone who has come to love and value and and really hold to the foundational truths in our creation story in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, it bugs me to no end when preachers and evangelists start the story of the gospel with sin. Because that's not how the story starts. Sin is not our orientation. Sin is disorientation that disrupted the wonderful world. Sin is the one that ruptured our relationship with God, our relationship with each other, our relationship with ourself. And thanks be to God, Jesus has come to reorient us. That's the storyline of the whole Bible in a nutshell. And that loop happens a million times between the first and the last page. But this orientation, this is the role that today's scripture was explicitly meant to play. It's a psalm of orientation. It talks of the heavens and the earth, the moon and the stars, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and humanity's dominion over all of them. What does that make you think of? The creation story. That's the biggest neon arrow pointing back to Genesis 1 you can build in the Bible, short of just straight quoting it. This is a psalm of creation. It's psalm reminding us of when all was right in the world, before sin and death entered the picture, when there was abundance, when there was potential and purpose. But this psalm of orientation is surrounded by disorientation. First, I'm literally in the book of Psalms. Psalm 1 and 2 set the foundation. Psalm 1 is, hey, God's word is great, and if we trust God, we'll grow like trees by good streams. And Psalm 2 talks about this victorious king that will call all earth to faithful living. But then Psalms 3 through 7, we get Psalms by one of the literal kings, the one named David, the one called a man after God's own heart. And here are the headings of this solely so-called victorious king, a psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom, a confident plea for deliverance from enemies, trust in God for deliverance from enemies, prayer for recovery from grave illness, a plea for help against persecutors. Does that sound like a great victorious king who's got everything together? No, not so much. And then we have our psalm, Psalm 8, and then what follows Psalm 9 through 14 are the cries of the people that David was leading about their needs and their poverty and the realities of violent enemies and nations that were going to destroy them and their need for deliverance. And right in the middle of the cries of the king and the cries of the people comes Psalm 8. 
And to just nerd out for a second, in ancient literary design, if you've got a whole bunch of things that are all on one theme, and yet in the middle is something different, that's the person who put the Bible together, the Holy Spirit, the editors, the collators, all those people, that's their way of saying, here, look here, this is what matters. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name throughout the earth. You made your glory higher than heaven. From the mouths of nursing babies, you have laid a strong foundation because of your foes in order to stop vengeful enemies. When I look up at your skies, at what your fingers made, the moon and the stars that you set firmly in place, what are human beings that you think about them? What are human beings that you pay attention to them? You've made them only slightly less than divine, crowning them with glory and grandeur. You've let them rule over your handiwork, putting everything under their feet, all sheep and all cattle, the wild animals too, the birds in the sky, the fish of the ocean, everything that travels the pathways of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name throughout the earth. This is a psalm of orientation surrounded by disorientation in the psalms, but also in the heart of the one who wrote it. David is very clearly struggling to understand how any of that could have been true. When I look at all creation, and then when I look at what I've done, and what we've done, why in the world are you still counting on us? Why do we even show up on your radar? The Bible Project folks like to say, we're just dirt creatures. And yet here we are, only slightly less than divine, crowned with glory and grandeur, tasked with rule and dominion over all of this. How is that possible? How, how is it possible? It is possible because at one time it was true. And it's still true underneath the disorientation that often clouds our views and consumes our focus and distorts our memories. That's not where we started. Sin and death, it's not where we started. It's not God's plan. We should never forget that. Look, we, we'll need to be honest about disorientation, especially the ways that we contribute to it. Jeremy's going to take us into that dark place next Sunday. It's going to be a lot of fun. But we can still allow orientation to be the lens through which we see this broken world today, can't we? It not only calls us back, but it also calls us forward in hope. Hope that God is faithful and will reorient us. It is not naive to believe that this is a wonderful world. It is not weak to believe that sacrificial love as Jesus modeled it is the right way to live. That's not weakness. And it is not foolish to believe that we have the power to help bring the kingdom of earth, the kingdom of heaven on earth as it is. Let me start that again. It is not foolish to believe that we as humans can help bring heaven here on earth. God saw something in us. Even more, God formed us with the purpose of joining in this mission, of being, we were made to be partners. It wasn't just like God looked around and was like, well, they're the smartest ones. We were made to be partners and stewards. And throughout the Bible, God refuses to give up on us no matter how badly we blow it. Jesus goes so far as to give his life while we were yet sinners. Can you see it? Can you remember your orientation? Can you hear the melody underneath all the noise of the world? Can you live in defiant optimism until the whole world hears that melody? 